Without further ado, I want to introduce this morning's guest, Dr. Porch. All too often when the subject of education comes up in Georgia, it's one that is not a particularly pleasant or uplifting discussion. Uh, suffice it to say, it, uh, uh, Linda Sharenko was here with us a couple of uh, months ago, that we have a lot of problems, a lot of challenges confronting us in the K through 12 area. Today's speaker, in contrast, has taken over a university system that is doing very well, and he is, in his 18 months, put it on a track to do much better to achieve national and international prominence. Dr. Porch is the youngest chancellor in the country. It is the fourth largest university system in the country. He is a very dynamic young man. He is very, very well respected around the country. He is, in his brief tenure at the helm of the University System of Georgia, already achieved a national prominence and is one of the most promising young educators in the country. We're very fortunate in Georgia to have Dr. Stephen Porch to head up our university system, and I will assure you under his guidance that our best days are ahead of us. Dr. Stephen Porch. Thank you. I uh, think it's probably cruel and unusual punishment to invite a speaker to speak at a breakfast meeting after an 11th inning loss. Uh, <laughs> but I'll do my best. Uh, I appreciate the introduction. Uh, I may be the youngest chancellor, but I'm the fastest aging one. I'll tell you that much. Uh, the introduction I appreciate, and some of you, I apologize you heard this story before, but uh, it does help people a little bit. When I first came to this state, I was uh, I embarked on what I thought was terribly important, and that was visiting all our 34 institutions. And I did that in my first 100 days and got to see this great state. And of course, the presidents uh, were wonderful in, in introducing me. They gave me extraordinary uh, flowery introductions. And then many of them would end by saying, and here's Chancellor Probst, because my name and his name were so similar. And so I had to come up with a little story for them to help them with my name. And it's about a little boy in a small Georgia town, went to the richest lady in town and asked for a summer job. She finally relented, gave him a job, said, look, take this bucket of green paint, go around the back of a house, and paint the porch. The kid did, came back an hour later, big old smile on his face, he's splattered in green paint. He said, lady, he says, lady, I'm done. He said, there's just one thing. That weren't no Porsche, that were a Ferrari. <laughs> so you can remember me as Porsche or Ferrari. I answered to both and a number of other things. Uh, so now you know my name, you need to know what my job is, and uh, the one piece of advice I give at every commencement I speak at is get a job your mother understands, because if you have to spend your life trying to explain to your mother what you do, you're in trouble. And so I went to the uh, Oxford English Dictionary, which is a wonderful, rich book if you're not familiar with it, and looked up Chancellor, and this is honest truth, uh, one of the first references was in 1066, and it's, it says a Chancellor is a petty official in charge of children, idiots, and lunatics. <laughs> you can see how little's changed in all those years? <laughs> there are days, however, to uh, get in the Olympic spirit, but I feel like the javelin thrower who uh, won the toss and elected to receive. But uh, uh, fortunately, in Georgia, I've not had many of those days. Uh, I did look very carefully before coming to this state. I'd spent 18 years in the University of Wisconsin. I was the number two person there. and uh, It's a very, very fine system and fully expected to end my career there. And then uh, late one night on February 9th, uh, I got a telephone call. And the Regents had decided for the first time ever to employ an executive search firm, A.T. Kearney from here in town. And uh, the charge to them was go find some people who aren't looking for a job. And I certainly fit that uh, bill. And they called me on February 9th. And it was a coincidence, I'm sure, but that night in Wisconsin, the temperature was minus 28 degrees. The wind chill was minus 73 degrees. My wife's under three blankets in front of a fireplace when I put the call on hold. And I called down to her and I said, there's a guy here who wants to talk to me about a job in Georgia. And she said, talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> well, I talked to him. And what I found, and uh, I want to say this because I want to give the credit where it belongs, uh, and that is to the leadership that's been in this state a number of years, uh, a very good system already. 
and I, I wasn't aware of that. So it was a good system which had not really told its story uh, particularly well. And some very uh, distinctive and innovative parts to it. And I found three things in particular, substantively, that I thought were a, a real strength. Uh, certainly the Hope Scholarship Program. In the history of American higher education, there has never been such a revolutionary program. Uh, I'm the one who dubbed it George's GI Bill, uh, and it truly is. It has the same potential to change the face of Georgia's landscape as the GI Bill did change the face of American society after the Second World War. It's having profound impacts, uh, not all of them yet understood, but above all else, it's raising aspirations, and it is also getting parents much more involved in their kids' high school education. They're looking at the grades much more carefully. I think it is superb public policy to raise the aspirations of uh, young people in the state. I also believe that some of the changes made last year were also fine public policy. I was a real advocate for removing the income uh, cap. There was a $100,000 income cap on Hope Scholarship. I was an advocate for removing that for a couple of reasons, and the most important being it is a scholarship in the university system, and I think a youngster deserves that recognition uh, regardless of what their parents earn. Uh, the second reason was just uh, real pragmatic. Uh, uh, under five, five to seven percent of the students were being eliminated on that basis, and we were having to do the work on reviewing the income level of every single parent to eliminate five to seven percent, and the bureaucracy of doing that did not uh, stand up. So I think that was a good improvement to the program, but I think it's simply a superb program. Virtually every single Georgia freshman at both Georgia Tech and the University of Georgia this fall is a Hope Scholar. A handful who are not. They happen to be able to run a 40-yard dash in about 4.4. <laughs> and at UGA right now, we wish it were more than a handful. But, uh, <laughs> but certainly that was one edge. Uh, the second edge I saw was the Georgia Research Alliance. Uh, not seen that anywhere else in the country. A public-private partnership and a public-private partnership between our research universities and the private universities in the country. Uh, North Carolina certainly uh, deserves all the credit for establishing a research triangle. But then virtually every other state tried to imitate it. And there are research parks in virtually every state in this country which really are real estate development, office building parks, because they're just, they have not taken off like North Carolina. And actually, if you want to be competitive, which I never am, uh, our research volume outpaces North Carolina. You put together our research universities and compare their research volume with North Carolina, and it, in fact, is greater. Uh, we are more distributed because we have uh, four research universities in our system and two in the uh, private sector, but our volume is great. But the investment in Georgia Research Alliance is in intellectual capital and not in a particular piece of real estate, which I thought was very innovative. The third area I thought the state already had an edge was clearly in technology, but this was an opportunity that we should grab advantage of. Uh, already one of the leaders in the country, I think uh, the GSAMs, the two-way distance education, is the largest in the world and is putting some new tools at our disposal which uh, pre present some great opportunities. So I certainly saw coming in here not a system uh, in trouble by any means at all. I saw a strong system with a lot of good quality. I found the presidential leadership to be uh, of first-rate quality and uh, the faculty and staff ready for change. And that is not typical in American higher education. I find them really ready to embrace change. They may not have been quite aware how much change, how quickly, uh, but uh, willing they were at least to uh, give us an opportunity. We immediately embarked on a strategic plan because that seemed to me the one missing ingredient. We didn't know where we were going, and we needed a blueprint into the next century. The Board of Regents themselves, and it's a strong Board of Regents, develop this plan. I, I simply facilitated that plan. And what we started out was a vision statement, because if you can't see where you're going, you most certainly will never get there. And I used as my great guider one of those superb Western philosophers, Wayne Gretzky. And when he was asked what distinguished him from all other ice hockey players, he said, I skate to where the puck will be, not where the puck is. 
And that's what our vision statement attempted to do. And then we established 35 principles, because as I looked through the minutes over a number of years, I saw some actions that we had taken which contradicted one another. And that's because there were no guiding principles to test those actions. And then once we'd done that, we flew into action. And to uh, quote Gretzky again, the reason we took so many actions so quickly was we consider we have a window of opportunity to take a quantum leap. The economy is good. The Olympics is going to bring great visibility, and the political scene is set at this moment. It's going to change, and at that point, I think we need to be considering some different approaches. But at this point, we had an opportunity for a quantum leap, so we wanted to grab it with both hands, and as Gretzky said, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. So we determined we were going to take a lot of shots. Uh, as you look down through those actions, uh, it begins with a mission review. What is our mission? What is our mission as a system? What is the distinctive mission of each of our institutions? We believe in bringing people in from outside. We brought in a team of consultants, of national leaders, to look at us and tell us not just how good we are, but how can we get better. If we are to be in a movement of continuous improvement, we need people telling us directly how we need to get better give you a couple of examples of things they told us about the system. They said that our system uh, essentially needs to get a little bit more disciplined and that we need to make a better distinction between needs and wants. But too often we make our decisions based on wants and wants are not the same thing as needs. Every chamber of commerce has wants. That's their job and I admire them for it. But those wants don't necessarily translate into needs. Everybody says we need this particular school or college or campus in our community. But I believe you've got to have a data-based needs assessment before you start doing that sort of thing or you're going to waste a lot of the state's money. It also said that uh, we need a little bit more discipline in terms of our off-campus sites. If you add up the number of locations in the state, there are over 100. And for the state to sustain that long term is going to be a major uh, problem. So that we need to become a little bit more disciplined there. Uh, I think I call Georgia the land of opportunity because everyone has an opportunity for us. Uh, if the downtown isn't working too well and the uh, local Sears building is closing, give it to the university. Uh, and then, you know, it's a wonderful gift. And then five years later, we have to spend half a million dollars putting a new roof on it and it was never well designed for us to start with. So we have to be a little bit more careful in sorting out, I think, the difference between uh, uh, opportunities and uh, things which are not real opportunities. As we move forward, there are some other things we have to do which uh, are good public policy. I know your interest is in public policy. Uh, cite a couple of those. I think it's going to be good public policy for us to manage our enrollment in this state on a strategic basis. We are the fourth largest system, 205,000 students uh, this uh, year. Uh, but it, we're going to grow, and we're going to grow quite dramatically over the next decade. We need to manage that growth, and we need a good public policy to utilize the capacity that already exists in the state first. We have some campuses which are fine little academic places, which have mothboard residence halls, for example. It makes more sense to me to use the faculty and residential capacity at those institutions first before we go spending a lot of money adding capacity elsewhere. And what we will find when we move students around this system, which we can do, as we move them around, they're going to discover they love the places they end up, even if it's not always their first choice. We have a good transfer system in this uh, system. So if students wish to move to University of Georgia, Georgia Tech, Kennesaw, whatever it is at a certain point, they will have the opportunity to do so. But we do need to manage our enrollment strategically to try and take care of uh, the uh, taxpayers' money here. Another thing we need to do is to look how can we use the distance education to meet people's needs. We recently had a classic example of that. Uh, we had a small two-year campus which had a lot of nurses with two-year degrees. And the hospitals now wanted them to have four-year degrees. In the old days, the only solution to that problem was to change that two-year college into a four-year college with all the enormous costs of doing that to meet one need, 
The need was there. It was documented. This was not a want. It was a clear need. One, being a four-year college was a want. Having nurses who wanted a four-year degree was a need. What we did in the end was that we went to Medical College of Georgia. They have placed two resident faculty at that campus and will deliver everything else by distance education. So we've used that powerful tool, I think, in a very good public policy way. We will meet that need, which incidentally may only be a relatively short-term need. It may only last five years. If there's a bubble of nurses in that situation, it's no, not clear that it will be a permanent need. And at that point, if that is the case, we can easily draw back without any uh, loss of uh, dollars in doing so. So I think that's an example of how we want to try and uh, use the technology put at our fingertips. We also want to look at some other things, uh, tuition policy. Uh, our current tuition policy does not charge out-of-state students the full rate. In fact, out-of-state students only pay 75% of the cost of their instruction. I would like Georgia to be a bargain, not a steal. And right now it's a steal. And uh, there's no public policy reason in my mind for the state taxpayers to subsidize out-of-state students, unless they can run a 4.4 in a 40-yard <laughs> desk. Uh, <laughs> and I will predict this. We're going to move that tuition up to the full rate. In fact, many states actually uh, make money on their out-of-state students. I'm simply saying we ought to recover the cost. And I'll predict this. When we price our product realistically, uh, we will actually see more applications from out of state because as we use that resource to even further strengthen our reputation, more students will want to come. So that's a, a good example. Another example is that I think we need to look at our present policy. We allow in certain border counties students from other states to come in as in-state residences. And when you start to look at our, some of our policies, uh, they don't make a lot of logical sense. If you live in South Carolina in a border county to Augusta right now, uh, this is the reality. Uh, you can come and pay in-state tuition. If your family decides to move over the river, move into Augusta, you have to wait 12 months. You pay a 12 months, you pay out of state. So if you live in Georgia, you pay out of state tuition. If you live in South Carolina, you pay in-state tuition. Hello. <laughs> so there are some things that we need to look at, and we are looking at them, and again, from a good public policy point of view. Yes, that increases our enrollment, which drives extra dollars coming to us from the state, but that is not, in my view, a good public policy, even though it is to our advantage financially in the long term, that's not good public policy. Some other areas we're looking at uh, very seriously is increasing our activities in the international education area. Uh, fewer than 2% of American students study abroad. In Georgia, it's fewer than half of 1%. That is not preparing us for a global society. And perhaps the most important thing to me of all is our work on admissions and P16. We coined the term P16 because we think it's very erroneous to talk about K-12 reform. You cannot reform K-12. You have to have co-reform of P-16. Sounds like a lot of jargon. Let me put it as clearly as I can. If a child does not come to first grade ready in body, mind, and spirit to learn, that child will never find their way to the university system. So how they enter that first grade is something we all ought to be concerned about. Sixteen, if you don't use the university as a bully to raise admission standards, you're missing a great opportunity to raise the standards of the whole state. Because what our entrance requirements are will become the exit requirements of the high schools. And we've got to be prepared to stand up and say we're going to do that. We're going to phase it in over 10 years because it's going to take time. We're going to have a massive communication campaign. And we're also going to do a massive pre-college program and offer every 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th grader in this state who lives in an at-risk situation, which is about 40% of the youngsters in this state come out of what we call at-risk situations. We're going to offer them a year-round pre-college experience on our campuses. Another area we've got to change, the senior year in high school. People ask me about the biggest difference between European education and American education. If I'd point to one thing, it's the senior year. Should be the most intellectually challenging and pushing year of a student's life. 
and it's a goof off year for so many students. We need to take that year and those students who are ready need to come to us early or they need to take some courses with us with the state's post-secondary enrollment program, that's possible. We need to challenge students more at that stage. If the high schools have given them everything they have to offer, come on, let's start in with us. Uh, West Georgia College has a wonderful new program they just started called the Academy. They have 21 high school uh, juniors and seniors in residence on their campus, uh, starting their college experience as juniors and seniors. Their combined SAT is uh, higher than Duke, I believe. Uh, so it's a sort of challenge we've got to do, but we've got to lift up this entire state. We're spending as much time concerned about P16 as anything else, because the long-term future of this state and the long-term future, therefore, of this university system is so entwined with the co-reform of what goes on throughout the education system. We're getting tremendous help of uh, the public sector, uh, the private sector, uh, terrific help in the state legislature, I, I tease them a lot, uh, they tease me back pretty good, but there are a lot of wonderful people uh, in the legislature and uh, uh, I thoroughly enjoyed the session. Uh, it's, I liked it because it was only 40 days long. Uh, it was 80 nights, but it was 40 days. <laughs> uh, I had a little transition problem. I'd never worked with a legislature with names like this one before, a governor called Zell, a lieutenant governor called Pierre, a majority leader called Sonny, uh, minority leader called Skin. Uh, this was tough for me. Uh, I was just glad for a few jacks around there to sort of level it out, but I, I'd never worked with people with names like this. And it wasn't going real well till I went over to the courthouse and changed my first name to Bubba, and then, <laughs> then everything went well from then on. We got uh, terrific support for our salaries, 6% commitment over the next uh, four years, and that's vitally important. We're a people business. The quality of faculty we can attract determines our future. Uh, Georgia State, for example, was able to tr attract a MacArthur Genius this year. Georgia Tech, uh, four of the national young investigators, scientists, uh, joined the School of Engineering. They had seven in total uh, to bring their combined total to 48 of uh, the top young scientists in the world are now at Georgia Tech, which incidentally is the number one public university in the country for average a SAT score. So we're attracting people, we're a people business. Our market, our competition is on a downslide right now elsewhere, and we can go out and raid and recruit very aggressively some of the top people. One of the projects I'm proudest of is our one state li wide library. It was an idea we'd had to use the technology to the advantage to the state. It was funded on St. Patrick's Day and on September 20th we launched it. I visited Georgia State 4.30 Friday afternoon to get a demo thinking I could get on the machines at that time. Had to stand in line to find a machine because the students love this new system. We've hooked every one of our university libraries together. And we've hooked them together so the catalog and all the resources of the university library are equally available to a kid in Waycross as they are to a kid in Athens. Uh, if you, one of a thousand journals, which is now online, you can pull it right up on the screen immediately. If it's not online, we will high speed fax. If it's a book, we will high speed, uh, courtesy of UPS and the Georgia State Patrol, the book overnight to you. And now we're gonna buy our books and our journals as a system. We're going to use our data to define how many we need, and then we're going to utilize that system to spread out our purchases. So every library isn't purchasing independently. We will spread that dollar power so much further. While we were at it, we designed the architecture so any DTAE library, K-12 library, public library, or any other library in the state that wish could join just for the additional cost that it would add to our system. We've designed it so that into the next century, Georgia will have one library in this state, and that a citizen, any community in this state, will have equal access to the library. That's using the power of technology. That's using good public policy to make the tax dollar purchase as widely as possible. That is acting as a system to bring equity to students, whether they're in South Georgia or Metro Atlanta and using the tools at our disposal to do it. So I'm delighted with that sort of initiative. Is all of this working? We think it is. We think the sort of talent who wants to come and join us is an indication. We hired five presidents last year, and we got our first choice in each of those cases. I had eight or nine positions available in my office, 
and we had over 1,200 applications from around the country to come and join us in this adventure. People want to be in Georgia. And if you read the annual almanac of the Chronicle of Higher Education, which is our little Bible in the business, they, once a year they describe all 50 states, what's going on in them, what the prospects are, what the sort of level of excitement is. Uh, that's an outside look, and I can tell you that if you read this year's almanac, there's Georgia, and then there's the other states, and there's a gap between them. It is the most uh, uh, dynamic and forward-moving state higher education system in the country right now. We've got to continue that. It's going to take a lot of commitment. We've got a lot of work yet to do. We do have a few new ideas for the next legislative session uh, to focus on teaching and learning and also to continue to capitalize on our technology. I have pledged to shave my head if the legislature fully supports uh, uh, everything in my budget. And just in case they do, I have Georgia Tech working on a virtual reality way of doing that. Uh, <laughs> but, but we are proud of where we are, and a lot of people have worked very hard. And if there's one word I would use to describe what's gone on is partnerships. Private sectors jumped in, our presidents, our faculty have jumped in, the legislature, the governor. People have pulled together to make this possible. Education is bipartisan, and we must always remember that. I work very closely with Linda Schrenko and Ken Breeden, and when people ask me about uh, the other sectors in education, I say they must all succeed because we are so much approaching a seamless system if they don't succeed, and politics must be put aside when you come to education because we must have success regardless of the politics of it. We got a lot of work to do. I see some promising signs. Uh, like Bob Dole, I look at popular culture for my signals. And two years ago when I looked at movies and saw that Forrest Gump was the most popular movie, I was very worried because of a message that movie sends. That movie says life is a box of chocolates and things just happen. If that's the message we're giving to young people, we're going to have problems. I'm much more excited this year because Apollo 13 is the movie. And Apollo 13 celebrates a, a president who had a vision and articulated it, the unleashing of American intellectual power like never before. And we too often celebrate anti-intellectualism instead of celebrating the accomplishments of the intellect. And that was a failed mess, uh, mission. And yet there was such great success came from that failed mission. Uh, but I think there's much to remember uh, from it. Also, do you see they use slide rules? Remember those things? Uh, it's amazing. Uh, in case we get too comfortable thinking that movies tell us we're moving in the right direction, uh, I noticed uh, that uh, they were having problem getting people to come to the madness of King George III. They did focus groups and they asked people, why aren't you coming to see it? And their answer was, we didn't see one and two. So, absolutely true story. So we do have a little work yet to do in uh, history and some other areas. Uh, as we do that, uh, we certainly want to remain accountable. In our budget request this year, the first third of our budget request is data on delivering on what we promised from last year. And we've delivered it in like 90 days. And we were determined to do that because we want to be accountable to the taxpayers and show what we're doing. We know we're going to get a better hearing if we've shown we've delivered. Results are what matter. And a little story to demonstrate that. There was an Atlanta taxi driver and an Atlanta Baptist minister. Both died at the same time. They arrived up at St. Peter. St. Peter said to the taxi driver, come on in. He told the Baptist minister to wait. And when the Baptist minister said to St. Peter, why did you make me wait and let the taxi driver in? He said, well, when the taxi, when you pray, your parishioners sleep. When the taxi driver drives, his passengers pray. <laughs> That's results. <laughs> so as we move forward, we are going to be accountable. We're going to show you our data. We're going to show you if we are improving, if our performance is increasing. And as we do that, we hope we will get your support. There are going to be some bumps along the way, and it's going to be the real test of the support whether people will stay with us through the bumps as well. But to quote Yogi Berra, to end on Yogi Berra, no better way to end a speech. Yogi Berra said, most of our future is ahead of us. We think most of our future is ahead of us. Thank you.